By permission of the Petty family, we're honored to be able to share with you on our channel Richard Petty's legacy and his history. We thought it was important, to, uh, not a lot of people know about it, and why we as uh, Fence Armour are so proud to be part of the, the Petty family and sponsoring Thad at uh, ARCA. Enjoy the movie and thanks for watching. to super speedways, there wasn't a race that Richard Petty couldn't win. Richard was NASCAR's first hero, and the Petties were its first family. A racing empire that spanned generations. None have more wins, none more championships. But success is difficult to sustain, and sooner or later, it would all fade away. While the Petty name would one day be known worldwide, the family's North Carolina hometown didn't appear on many maps. Level Cross is a small southern town marked by whistle stops, crossroads, and backwoods. Although the world around has changed, life here has not. During the Great Depression, farmers worked the red clay fields until their hands were stained the same. It was a simpler time but there was nothing simple about their way of life. For generations, Level Cross is where the Petty family has called home. Now I'm just a simple guy, but there's one thing sure to shoot me. I hate those folks who think that they're... We lived in a, a three-room house on a dirt road, had no electricity, no telephone, you know, no communications. You didn't know there was another world out there. So you lived in your world and you was happy as a June bug because you had as much as a guy next door. A cornbread loving country boy. I raised cane on Saturday, but I go My brother and myself, we slept in a, a twin bed until, until really I got married, which was 21, 22 years old. So when we say we grew up together, we definitely grew up together. They were very stern. They had certain rules. You knew what the rules were, and if you broke them, you got whopped. 
money, but we It was not a deal where we was abused by any ways. Uh, we thought we was being abused, but, but we weren't. I would describe them as pretty strict parents, very loving, but it was not a shown love. My dad was just a hot rodder, okay, and uh, he had a couple of trucks. He did a lot of trucking. Sometimes he'd raise some pigs. Uh, sometimes we'd raise tomatoes in the summer. You know, he'd, he'd done a little bit of everything. Everybody at that particular time was just trying to get along. Nobody trying to get ahead. They're just trying to make a living. One way to make a living was to make moonshine, an easily distilled corn whiskey that has been a staple of Southern life since the Civil War. Moonshine runners could make more in one haul than farmers made in a month. But getting it to customers was a risky business. Government revenue agents patrolled the back roads, so bootleggers drove cars rebuilt to outrun them. They drove for the money. Lee Petty drove to feed his family. He hauled liquor, there ain't no two ways about it. Mom and Richard and myself, a lot of times we get to ride with him in the night when everybody drops. And then and even after that, we got to go to the movies, so. <laughs> my granddaddy and a bunch of my uncles and stuff, they had some steals around. They, they did a little bootlegging, too. You know, and you didn't think anything about it because it was just a way of life in Level Cross. The whole neighborhood made liquor and they sold it. And if you didn't, you would go hungry, I'm sure. These liquor cars, they'd all get together and everybody brag about how fast their car was. And they used to race them on the road for money, big money. Because they worked on their cars and souped them up so they could outrun the law, then they got to souping them up and running each other on these little tracks or whatever. It was not a look up to sport, it was a look down to sport. The people in our community and the people we went to school with were more looking at the deal. It's just a bunch of bootleggers, okay, just a bunch of outlaws. They weren't people that you wanted to invite to Sunday dinner, I don't guess. Racers were a rowdy bunch. Good old boys out to have a good old time. But stock car racing was unorganized until a part-time driver named Big Bill France headed up a new organization. The National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing. NASCAR turned racing into a series and gave drivers a chance to race for a living. It was the opportunity Lee had been waiting for. His moonshiner experience making everyday cars go faster led to fast success. Now we have a battle for the lead between Tim Flock in 91 and Lee Petty in 42. I always looked at him as being probably the smartest driver that I've ever seen because one week he would run hard and the next week he wouldn't run hard, but he went on both weekends. He drove for a living. He, he didn't drive for somebody else. He knew that if he didn't finish that race, then we might not get to the next race. Oh, well, we had to win. We had we go to the racetrack and we was looking to have enough food, and enough gas to get to the racetrack. That's the truth. We drove the race car to the racetrack. I drove a race car all the way from here to California and race. I drove it all the way to New York, race Canada. It were, we didn't have no luxury at all. I guess he was one of the first ones to make a living, especially for his family, in racing. And uh, when he decided to do it, he just, uh, he just went at it and, and made it work. When my dad worked on the race car, we were there helping him. 
Dale was in and out helping us. He was almost like a third brother. I was the only guy in school that went home and didn't work on the farm. I went home and worked on a race car. I was building the engines in the car, doing the rear end stuff, doing the body work, you know what I mean, painting the car or welding up the car or building whatever it was. Daddy was, he was real strict. I mean, you know, you, you had to walk the line and he spoke, you listened. He thought nothing about it he, because he grew up in the depression. He grew up in hard times and everybody took everything they could get. He was tough on Morris and Richard, very tough on them. And uh, his mother tried to keep the happy medium, you know. But he was tough and he liked being Mr. Tough. Getting in with are still fighting it out for second. He was a dirty racer. He won't appreciate that, but he's the guy that put me out of business at Darlington 57. Eddie and Turner are in a furious battle for the lead. When I told you we all lived together in the family, that didn't include Lee Petty. He didn't stay with us. Uh, Lee did not drink with us. I don't think that Lee drank. But Lee certainly didn't chase like we did. And uh, so we socially were never ever together. He was a family man where a lot of them that come to the races, they, uh, maybe they, they come to party and just, they happen to have a race and they would run it. Lee Petty and his family were among the leaders in helping to change the image of the sport from its original background. Lee presented a family type image and his family was always with him at the races. His wife would fix lunch and either send with them to the racetrack or bring it to the racetrack for them. So it was a total family effort. She was very supportive of my dad, no matter what he did, whether he was farming or doing stuff legal or illegal. She went along with whatever the show was. My dad and mom and Richard and myself he hooked the old race car behind the, had a tow car, he hooked it behind it and off we go. We'd go to Charlotte or Richmond or we wound up going to Pennsylvania. You know, I mean, said, man, you know, these people got paved roads and they got electricity and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it really opened our world up in a, just in a couple of three years, we went from, from being really way backwoods to see the real world. All through my school years, I, n I never thought about driving a race car. I said, you know, hey, my dad's driving, he'll drive forever, never thought about him not driving. So I wanted to be the crew chief on my dad's car. And then when I was like 18 years old, I said, hey, dad, you know, they got some of these guys that's 18, 19 years old running, I want to drive a race car. He looked at me and he said, come back when you're 21. He said, you, you'll do a lot of learning from the time you're 18 to you're 21. In the pits, young Richard Petty can only wait and wait and wait. Never felt like this until I kissed ya. Well, after I got out of school then, uh, I was kind of hot rodder around, had a hot rod car and raced up and down the road. My brother was going to school and his girlfriend and Linda were both cheerleaders and I went to all the games. And one night Richard just jumped in the car and said, I'm going with Morris to take you, take y'all home. I think I had a 
a little girl I was sparking over on the side here somewhere, and I think she had her boyfriend. You know what I mean? And so it just happened. He was zooming in on me, but I was being very leery of him being an older guy, you know. But uh, it didn't take long for me to think he was a pretty super nice guy. A lot of times we'd go to a uh, drive-in to get something to eat, and he's like, whatever you want to eat, just order it. And oh my goodness, the hamburgers were always delicious. <laughs> it just worked. I mean, it was just a, a deal after a while, then we just got to be a pair. I was going to get married when I got out of school, and he said to me one day, he said, we need to go ahead and get married because I'm going to start racing and I'm going to be gone a lot and I want you to be my partner. And she said, okay. I mean, you know, she's, what, 17 years old? You know what I mean, still in high school? So we said, okay, we're going to do this. I knew in my best mind that was not the right thing for me to do right then. But anyway, finally we ran off. When we did get married, and I told her, I said, you know, I said, you got to remember this. I said, racing is number one. But if you try real, real hard, someday you can be number two. <laughs> she looks back, she said, man, was I innocent. I was young and stupid. And I said, oh, I'll just be happy being number two. So that's where I've been all my life is number two. Right before I think I was 21 years old, I went to my dad and said, okay, I want to drive a race car. Well, he said, there's a car over in the corner. I was a raw, raw rookie. I had never been in a race car with a helmet on and a seatbelt hooked up and tried to run fast. It was a challenge of doing something on your own without any help. Okay, they give you a car, they give you a steering wheel, then it's your responsibility, you're 100%. You can get on the brakes, you can get on the gas, you can turn left, you can turn right. I guess I felt like I had more control over what I wanted to do and what I could do than any other time in my life. You know, when we first started running, uh, my dad was at the top of the heap and I was at the bottom of the heap. I don't know, I had a half a dozen races or something where we ran together. And one of them was a 150 mile race at Lakewood Speedway in Atlanta. We go run all day and the place is really dusty and dirty. They flagged me the winner. I had never won a race, okay? So this is, this is great, man. Somebody comes up and says, Hey, somebody's protested the race. And I said, what did we do wrong? They said, well, they think they run more laps than you did. And turned around there and it was my dad. Richard's mother scored his dad's car. And sure enough, when they went back and rechecked, they found out that Richard's daddy did win the race, that Richard didn't win it. And Richard was so upset with his daddy. I mean, that was a win for him. That was a shock, really, that uh, it would have given Richard uh, an opportunity to, to, to win that early in his career, and yet his dad uh, said, nope, you didn't win it, I did. And uh, when you look at it from a father-son standpoint, you say, well, you, you know, you want your son to do better than you did, but at the same time, you want to be fair. This was the petties. This was the cost of racing. This was how Lee had become a two-time champion. Nobody had won more races. He was his sport's first king. But in 1959, a new era in NASCAR had begun. With concrete turns three times taller than the Petty's home, the Daytona International Speedway offered unbridled horsepower like nothing the world had ever seen. going through the tunnel, and you're a 21-year-old kid coming in, never seeing the racetrack. It looked like it was 15 miles down to the first and second corner. Man, that was a big racetrack. 
what the hell is this? Uh, you know, it, it was just a monster. It scared the hell out of me, I'll put it that way. And it doesn't only scare me, it scared everybody that come down in through that tunnel. Because we'd been running half a mile, a quarter mile, and maybe a mile track now and then. And we look up there and see this monster, you know what I mean? And God, people's eyes popped out of their head. And so I said, well, to myself, I said, those fellas ain't got no more experience to run this dang race car than I have. And so I said, I'll just get in there and run wide open. That's what I did. In the first Daytona 500, Lee and Johnny Beauchamp barreled neck and neck toward the checkered flag. The checkered flag. Both Petty and Beauchamp fought in the identical time. Immediately after the race, Beauchamp was declared the winner. Lee protested. The photo snapped at the finish line would take three days to develop. On Wednesday, the front pages revealed that the defending NASCAR champ was the first champ of the Daytona 500. Two years later, father and son were back to reconquer Daytona. But the track of the family's greatest triumph became the site of catastrophe. I got in a wreck and uh, went over the first corner, went out of the ballpark. Just as I walk out in the infirmary, they said Lee Petty just went over to turn three and four wall. got to the hospital, um, they said, we don't think your daddy's gonna live. Said, it is, it's gonna be touch and go. Went in to talk to him, he was about half conscious, and all just tore all the pieces, cut up everywhere. Ribs broke, punctured lung, just his leg all, just all busted off, just hanging there. And he looks up and he said, okay, he says, y'all going home, going up to the Plymouth dealer and buy a new car. Everything we had that day was gone. We had nothing, nothing but mangled sheet metal to load up to send back home. But we left there that Monday and we did not know if his daddy would live or die. There was two or three of the people that had worked for us, and they felt like his daddy was going to be gone, and they quit. So eventually, when Mars came home, there wasn't anybody but Mars and Richard. All of a sudden, it was on a 23-year-old kid and his 21-year-old brother. I mean, if that was pressure, I don't remember. You know, we, you just done what you had been taught to do, and that's what you done. Nobody knows what they can do till they put under the gun, okay, and then you either produce or you don't. And the toughest part was we wasn't doing too good. <laughs> that made it really, really tough to be able to come up with enough money to get to the next race. Well, you drove a great race. What happened down there? Well, I lost all the oil pressure. I think I must have uh, burned a bearing on the Burned a bearing on the engine. All through 61, he just struggled and struggled and struggled. It was a terrible year, but I knew that it with Richard's positive attitude that he would make it work. He wanted to race and he was willing to do whatever it took, and Mars did too. They just persevered, and that's what it takes. That's how people succeed. They don't throw in the towel.
This is Bob Smith of WNDB Sports Department at the hospital bedside of Lee Petty, world-famous stock car driver from Randleman, North Carolina. Lee, as you know, is presently recovering from injuries received in a race here at Daytona Beach on February the 24th. Lee, how are you today? Bob, I'm feeling real good, and I'm glad you was able to come over today because I think I feel better today, and I want to say hello to all my friends, and plus uh, I'm looking forward to the race, and maybe Richard will win it to make me feel lots better. Lee Petty, we want to thank you very much for allowing us to come into your hospital room here today. Bob, it's really been a pleasure that I was able to do this for you, plus all the friends and the people over the radio throughout the country today. Lee spent four months in a Daytona hospital. While the wreck didn't end his life, it ended his driving career. The future of Petty Enterprises was put into the unproven hands of a 23-year-old Richard. Lee became the boss man, but the family business soon became less about family and more about business. It was his business. He hired me as his driver, and he expects me to win. So you don't go over and pat the guy on the back, hey man, you've done a good job. That's what I hired you for. That's the way he looked at it. When we didn't do good, now he could flat tell you what you needed to do to get better. Now he could do that. Richard would come in on a, on a Monday and his daddy would start like, well, what was wrong with that car yesterday? What was wrong with you yesterday? He didn't pay you compliments for anything you done good. It was always what you done that wasn't good. I felt like I was learning and accomplishing what my ability was. I was just trying to make it work the best I could, whether it was driving the car, whether it was with a family. So there was a lot happened in those couple of three years. We had two children just boom, boom, right together. Sharon and Kyle are exactly 12 months apart. So a lot of times I couldn't go with Richard and I was home with the kids. It was just a total different way of life. Now, grant you, we didn't have a fine home or a big new car, but we had each other and we were happy. I never remember my mama whining and crying, saying, I wish your daddy was here or anything like that. You know, my mom is um, a very independent person. I'm sure there were times she was lonely. I'm sure there were times she needed him desperately. She didn't let us know. My mother was incredibly strong. Uh, she was the disciplinarian, whether it was our grades, whether it was something we did uh, after school or before school or to another student or to our brothers or sisters. Um, she was the one that kind of took the bull by the horn and, and kind of put us back in line. I was the one, and you can ask him. You ask Kyle, did your daddy ever whip you? And he'd say, no, but my mother whaled the daylights out of me. Linda was the homebody. She took care of everything at, at home. So we lived two separate lives together, okay? You got to figure, you know, you got a 27, 28 year old kid and all he wants to do is drive a race car. And so family came second around racing. Richard had some wins on small tracks in 1962 and 63, but the 43 car didn't have the raw speed to win the big races. Then in 1964, Dodge introduced its race ready 427 horsepower engine the Hemi. With Richard behind the wheel and Maurice under the hood, the family business was back in business. And there is a checkered flag for Richard Petty, the winner of the 6th Annual Daytona 500. Richard, how long have you been in this racing business? Oh, about five years now. Is your biggest victory? This is it. This is the first time I ever won on a major speed run. Now, your father was a champion before you. How much longer are you going to be in this business? Well, I guess from now on, just like he is. Richard's first Daytona 500 win would lead to his first NASCAR championship. Over the next three years, the 43 won races big and small. 
Betty's about to win his second Daytona 500, but he'd be the first to ever win it twice. At Darlington in 1967, his 55th win broke his father's NASCAR record. Richard Petty wins the Southern 500. Richard Petty, a man who today at the Darlington Raceway made racing history. And with his father, the man whose record he broke. Lee, how do you feel about all this? I feel real good, Chris. I think he drove a real good race. The car handled good, and we had all the luck with us. We just hit. I mean, we won a race, then we went home, worked on the car, went back and won the second race. Yeah, that's great. Then all of a sudden you win five, and you win six, you win seven, eight, nine, ten races in a row. We reached the third plateau, now we need to go on. We're no looking back then. to the racetrack wondering who was going to run second. Come home in the middle of the night or early in the morning and the wife said, how you do? I said, yeah, we won again. Just, you know, it was great. So it's a happy crew along pit road with the petty name on their back. Maurice had, had zeroed in on the engine building part of it and had become what was considered then the best in the business. He wouldn't sleep. I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd take a nap and he'd wake up and think of something else he was going to do the next day and write it down or jog it in his brain and go back to bed and then wake up again. I mean, he was always a, an innovator. That's why they kicked their butts. Dale Inman, of course, uh, having grown up with Richard and Maurice, he knew what made them tick and had learned over the years what it took to make the car tick. Petty pit. I'm not saying it seemed easy. Richard was a pretty good driver. When they got their combination together, Mars building the motors, Richard driving the car, and Dale turning the wrenches, they were almost unbeatable. Petty's won more races in one season than any other driver in NASCAR history. Petty is a favorite every time a flag drops. Petty Blue flies under the checkered flag. Winner. By the mid-1970s, Richard Petty had become an auto racing icon. He would win the Daytona 500 a record seven times, and he would win an unprecedented seven championships. No driver in history would win as many races. Among the fans, he was their runaway favorite. He was the king. I don't know who started the name King, you know what I mean? It, but it's great, you know, it, it, it's big for him. Well, I think he projected a wholesome, good old boy image. He didn't drink, he didn't fight, and that appealed to people. They liked a hero. What parent didn't want their kid to love Richard Petty? Little John, huh. tell him who you love. Hey, look, talk to these men right here. Tell them who you love. John. Say, your name is John, and I'm two years old. I'm two years old. And said, I love Richard Petty. I love Said I went to Daytona to see Richard Petty. Tell him, tell him news, man. I've been Daytona, I went Petty. The fans was buying the tickets, so you say, okay, these are the people that's letting you do what you want to do. And that's drive a race car. And when the race was over, you'd be give out and they'd give you oxygen, okay? And you sit there for three or four minutes, get some oxygen, take the oxygen away, and then you start signing autographs. I mean, you know. Nobody ever said a race car driver was smart, did they? <laughs> he would sit there till the last person got an autograph and left. We would wait, and we would wait, and we would wait, and we would wait, and sometimes it would be getting dark, and finally here he had come, wandering to the car after we might be like the only person in the infield left. And then sometimes this is this is really bad, and it happened a lot. Like we would open the doors and shut them like so much during the day that the battery would be dead. And here's Daddy just driven 500 miles, and he comes and gets in his car. All he wants to do is go home, and it won't start. That's how he got to be so popular with the people. 
he was the very first one to intermingle with the fans. As the sport grew up, Richard Petty set the standard for the drivers' understanding of the level of importance that the fans have in our business. Richard throws open the doors of the Petty compound for an open house celebration that draws nearly 40,000 turned on Petty fans. They formed a line more than a mile long, waiting patiently to shake the hand and get the flourishing autograph of King Richard. Richard signed autographs for two solid days. There we go. You turn right around and sit down right there. Oh, I'd love it. I'd no, sit down okay. right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you come over here and sit down there. Yeah, that's what I'm here. <laughs> Lee Petty, you were one of the sport's first great champions. But of all the champions in stock car racing, Richard Petty is the greatest. As you look out here and see all these people and know of Richard's success, uh, what does it mean to you? It's uh, what you call an inner satisfaction. I really can't express it, but it's, it's an inner satisfaction that uh, you accomplish and it materializes over the years. I just felt like that was part of me, part of my job, part of what I wanted to do, part of what I was wanting to accomplish. I look at my autograph and it says, thank you. Thank you for buying a ticket. Thank you for paying for my kids to go to school or eat or the house they live in. So every time you see my autograph, it doesn't say Richard Petty. It says, thank you. Kyle Petty was born into an established racing dynasty. But growing up as the only son to the king made it challenging for the boy to become his own man. The option of racing was always there, waiting for him. But Kyle's future was not preordained. When Kyle was little, people would come up and say, I bet you're gonna be a race car driver just like your dad. And I kept saying, I don't think so. I don't think so. The mountain is high, the valley is low, and you're confused on which way to go. So I'll come here to give you a hand and lead you into When I was uh, seven, eight, nine years old, you'd race your bicycles. Everybody raced your bicycles. And you would pretend you were Richard Petty, whoever it may be. But you never really thought that far ahead. I, I never really said, eh, well, yeah, when I get to be, you know, 18 years old, I'm gonna be a race car driver. And Kyle just always did whatever. I mean, if, if, if this was a trend, Kyle was just gonna do whatever. I mean, Kyle never went along with the crowd. You know, he played football, basketball, baseball, and golf. Kyle was really a good football player, he was really a good quarterback. He had been to, I don't know, Georgia Tech, been to Carolina, been, been to a bunch of different schools, and they, they were recruiting him. I probably had some athletic ability, but I did not have the heart or the passion to play football. Um, I didn't like getting hit. If he wasn't going to college, we wanted him to go to a business school. So we sent him to a business school, and he must have went for maybe a month at the most. And one day the lady called and she said, I'm gonna refund your money, don't send him back. He's not interested in this business school. So that ended his business career. One day I just woke up and I knew more about racing than I knew about anything else, and I'm lazy, so I just went the easy route. He's really smart and he's got a lot of talent, but his daddy was Richard Petty. Sometimes I look at him and I feel like that he got kind of, what, what did you expect him to do? And I think that his intentions were to go at it and he might not ever be as good as his daddy, but I think he felt like he could be almost as good. Oh, he definitely felt the pressure of, of being Richard Petty's son. All the expectations were that he's going to start where his dad is and go forward from there. Kyle's career began in 1979 with a lower level race on NASCAR's trademark track, Daytona. In his first race, 18-year-old Kyle scored his first win, 
he made a phenomenal first impression. But early success was short-lived. The toll of running two cars full-time drained the team. Kyle couldn't win, and the King had stopped winning. Then Dale Inman, Richard's crew chief, cousin, and closest friend, quit Petty Enterprises. You know, we've been not doing as good as what both of us would want to do as far as winning races. And he just said, okay, it's time that I need to go see if I can do something else. It had probably got to a point where maybe I wasn't getting along with Maurice and Lee as good as I thought I should have. You know, it wasn't only business. I mean, it was a lot personal, too. I can remember when Dale left, Daddy got really quiet. It's like somebody died, you know? Just that morning that you go through when you lose somebody, it was, it was bad. It was a big void because we had depended on him to run so much of, of Petty Enterprises up to that time. I think Dale Inman was always more of a leader at Petty Enterprises than Richard Petty was. Richard Petty was the front man. There's a difference in being a front man and being a leader. And if you watch the way things played out at Petty Enterprises after Dale left, we all went our separate ways within another two or three years. When Dale Inman left, the downfall was fast and success came to a standstill. It was 1983. The reality was the team was short on leadership, short on horsepower, and fading fast. Then at Charlotte, Maurice's motor powered the 43 to their 198th win. But post-race inspection would reveal an illegal engine. Who knew what was not important. History would remember the team had cheated. It was bad. I mean, we, we never meant to cheat. Mars was the big person. He was the scapegoat for the whole deal. I had to do it. I was the guy that made the decision. This is what's going to happen. That's how we're going to do it. The point, well, that's why I dragged Richard through the mud. Him and Mars had some other differences after that, but he just felt like it was time for Mars to bow out of Petty Enterprise. It hurt. I mean, you know, I'd be a dang old liar if I said it didn't hurt. And, but, uh, you know, that's uh, your path laid out for you, and that's, that's the road I got led down. I still love my brother. I ain't got no beef with him. The petty racing dynasty that originated in Level Cross, North Carolina, was never a team. It was a family. Now America's first family of racing is breaking up. As the breakup takes place, the clan patriarch, Lee Petty, hones his golf game on the front lawn and deals with the question, why? Time, time, time. It's no, no way that uh, things today are like it was yesterday. And it's no way tomorrow it'll be like it is today. The future is Kyle Petty. Just as if Richard Petty took over from Lee Petty, it's time for Kyle Petty to start in that vein to take over from Richard Petty. One of us was going to have to go. Uh, either Richard Petty was going to have to go or Kyle Petty was going to have to go for the company to survive. We were not going to be able to generate the income that we needed to run two cars. And it just, it wasn't going to work. And I said, okay, the best thing for us to do is for me to move out of here, get a sponsorship for Kyle's car, and pretty well let him run his own show. I would say Kyle's going to come out the worst on this thing because he's got a long way to go and a lot to learn. At the end of the year, if things don't go well, Kyle can't say, well, Uncle Morris, it's your fault, or Daddy, it's your fault. It can't be anybody's fault but Kyle's because Kyle's running the show. Initially, the plan was I was going to run what was a single car team. And that worked pretty good 
for maybe about a month to 45 days. And then nobody liked what I was doing, so the king sticks his nose back into it. And he wanted to leave, but he didn't want to let it go. And probably put too much pressure on Kyle because Kyle was trying to be a car owner and a mechanic and a driver and a businessman. It's one of the shortcomings that Richard Petty had. Why didn't I just quit? You know, and then spend all my time and my effort and my sponsorship just on the one car with Kyle. But we didn't do that. And that was probably a greedy deal on my side because I was still enjoying what I was doing too. Petty Enterprises pared down to one car, but the team continued its steady, unceasing decline. Richard had left the Level Cross shop, taking his sponsorship and his number to a new team. While the King wasn't running the way he once did, he did start running better. Winning his 199th race was already the most in NASCAR history. Win number 200 would be an historic milestone. It was July the 4th, the president was there. It was just like if we had wrote the script, it couldn't have been any different. All right, gentlemen, start your engines. They take the green flag for the Firecracker 400. They're going off on lap one. Yarborough holding his lead on the inside of the track. He fought that day one of the toughest competitors that he ever fought, and that was Kale Yarbrough. And Kale was dying to win that race, he said. We are building toward a dramatic finish. President Ronald Reagan looking on alongside Bill Graham Jr. It is Richard Petty in car 23, Kale Yarbrough in car 28. Now as they try to position themselves for the last lap first of the finish. his 200th career NASCAR victory. You know, we wind up winning the 200th race in front of the President of the United States on July the 4th. I mean, you know, who's going to believe this crap, you know? Uh, you know, 200 is, is very, very important, but uh, under the circumstances, uh, with all the presidents that's ever been in the United States, this is the first one that's ever showed up at a racetrack. So everybody's got to go from that from a racing standpoint, and I wanted to be the one that was able to, to welcome him to Grand National Racing. They had uh, locked down the, the garage area and we had a picnic, and, and that, that was great. I mean, all these people have never seen the president or whatever, eat dinner with him. We were sitting right beside the president, and we were eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, and it was just, it was just one of those days you think, this came in because it's just been a great day, a great day. There have been a number of things over the years that have happened that seem to take the sport to another level. And that was one of those. Some of the races, I looked back and I said, man, we should have won this race and we give this one away. But for the 200th to come out, then all the rest of the races that I lost or, or whatever had to be in order for fate to put you there on July the 4th in front of the president, last lap, 200th win. Richard would race for eight more years but his 200th win would be his final trip to Victory Lane. Then in 1985, Kyle left Petty Enterprises to drive for another team. It proved to be the fresh start that he needed. Checkered flag is coming out. Kyle Petty has won it. His first wins 
Boston Cup victory. Coming down to take the checkered flag, ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Petty. The Wood Brothers have done it. They have won the Coca-Cola 600. Away from the family business, Kyle finally had the chance to forge his own identity. He could not be his own person and do his own thing. If he refused to sign an autograph, it was people like, well, he's not like his daddy. That doesn't bother him because he doesn't want to be like his daddy. I did not want to be a clone of my father either. Okay, so I understood where he was coming from. That was one of the reasons why you seen Kyle with long hair, earrings, you know, doing everything different than what his father did. So that it was Kyle Petty, it was not Richard Petty's son, it was Kyle Petty. Here's a man that drives a Thunderbird 240 miles an hour. Please welcome Kyle Petty. But he went to Nashville. But he did. Got a record deal. Let old square bottle makes my head go. Well, that's just, that's just his difference. He wants to be different. You would never see Richard Petty wearing a long ponytail. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, what y'all doing in there? He just wants his own identity. And I think any time you have a, a father who is accomplished in anything, and he has one son that son has a lot of expectation. And so I have grieved for that part for Kyle. It had taken Kyle six years to win his first cup race. Over the next six seasons, he won four more. It should have been considered a solid career for anyone other than the King's son. Back at Petty Enterprises, Richard and Dale Inman reunited, but there was no recapturing the past. Race after race, season after season, the team continued to finish out of contention. The King's reign had long been over. Oh, and Richard is out of control. On the track, nobody feared him. Instead, they began to fear for him. There is the battered remains of Richard Petty's automobile here this afternoon. Richard Petty still looking for victory number 201 in his career. Been a long time since number 200. I never dreamed about Richard Petty not being in a race car. Did he drive longer than he should have? Uh, you know, I don't know. I thought he would just race forever. He's just worn out. He's wasted. And that's unfortunate for such an incredible competitor like Richard. There were some people that thought that he should, should hang it up. You, know, you always hear that the people have a tendency to remember you for the last thing you did. And you don't want them to remember you as a has-been. Sometimes I would get really upset and I'd say, have you thought about quitting? Have you thought about getting out of this? And he'd say, nope, no, I hadn't thought about it. There was no way she was gonna to try to talk me into quitting if I wasn't ready because I'd never been happy with quitting if I hadn't made the decision myself. The older he got, the more my mother worried about it. She always felt like you could, you could only tempt fate so many times and then something would happen. are just screaming, Richard Petty's flipping, flipping. So I'm walking down to the infirmary, and the minister, he come to the door, and he said, 
come on in, Linda, he's okay. And when we walked inside, there was a closed circuit TV. And all I could see on that screen was that car up on the fence. And I thought, they are lying to me. He is dead. He's got to be dead. I'm laying there looking at the ceiling. I hear somebody come in. She'd been crying. The wreck really did look spectacular. And I know it scared her to death. And I said, you, you don't even have a clue how frightened I was because I thought that was the time that you were gone. After four decades, 1992 would be Richard's last season behind the wheel. He marked his retirement with a farewell tour. It was a fitting end for a star who had spent his career staying in touch with his fans. Hey, you doing, Rudy? That's, that's doing? Richard Pitt. Okay. This is Matthew. Give me five. All right. It was another one of those watershed marks that established what a, a successful athlete does to pay back those who made him successful. It connected and bonded the fan to the driver. We done an autograph signing. This guy broke down and cried and cried. He could not believe he was finally meeting Richard Petty. And I'm like, I can't even comprehend that. And so today, on the 4th of July, this president comes not only to greet the American people and the fans here, but to, this president comes to greet a king, Richard Petty, one of the great Americans. Richard, I'm proud to be at your side. It was just great that the NASCAR and the fans and the press and everybody got behind, and it made me feel good that they recognized and appreciated what we had meant to the racing. Not only a championship at stake here today, but perhaps as important, it's the final race for a guy who started his career back in 1958 and has become the king of stock car racing. It's Richard Petty's final ride. Petty, start your engine. When he got in that race car for the last time, he was sad because we knew how much he loved it. And it, it was just sad for us to see him have to say, I'm not going to do it anymore, ever, the rest of my life. Last race that we run got in got in a wreck and they had to rebuild the full front end of the car just so that I could say and they could say well he ran his last lap and Richard Petty is taking one final lap around this racetrack as the fans salute him and his career comes to an end sit down in the front of the trailer uh, and okay and here comes Linda and Lisa and Sharon and Rebecca and they come in there and they all get to cry and I get to cry and well you know we sat there and cried for about five minutes and then we got happy I mean you know they were they were so tickled that it was over with you know what I mean and I guess I was too the race they put daddy in the back of a convertible and mama was sitting beside him and they did this lap around the track and the look on my mom's face 
of relief, yes. joy. You know, it was like, finally, you know, I don't have to worry about him. And there was just that, we made it. We did it. We spent our entire life sticking together, raising a family, doing something he loved. And the most awesome thing out of it was he was the best there ever was and ever will be. Richard's final season was ironically his son's finest hour. In 1992, Kyle finished fifth in points and ran in championship contention. But his success was overshadowed by the King's retirement. Fifteen years and eight wins after leaving, Kyle returned to drive for Petty Enterprises. But it was clear, Richard's son would never be King. Anything he set his mind to, he could do until he decided he was going to be a race car driver. But he could not conquer that race car. Never conquered it like his daddy. He had pure talent, and I won't say it was wasted. I'll just say that he never developed it to his fullest extent. Maybe this is why I never won 100 races and I never won a bunch of championships. Because I never came to the sport to say, I'm going to make it in this sport. i got to make it in this sport. Uh, I looked at the sport a little bit different. I grew up in, in rural North Carolina where people are dairy farmers, people were tobacco farmers. And, and there's a lot of farms in my community that are fourth and fifth generation farms. The way I looked at it, I just happened to be a third generation farmer that raised race cars. And it was my job to keep the business and keep the Patty name alive. That fellow that Kyle is holding is a fourth generation Patty. That's Adam. We went to a lot of races together. We traveled a lot with Adam, and we went to Daytona's. Uh, we went to Charlotte's, we went to Martinsville. My career was taking shape at the same time my family was taking shape, and they went as much as they could go. There weren't buses, there weren't airplanes back then, and that was long trips in a car, and then you sat in an infield in a car with no potty, and for me, as a wife, it's the same thing as it is for him. It's a lifestyle. You know, when the first grandchild is born, he kind of belongs to everybody. You know, he's all of ours. So everybody's world revolved around Adam. You know, everybody did everything for him. I tell you, if you know Adam for the first 12 or 14 years, that was the most aggravating kid you have ever seen in your life. Hi, my name's Adam Petty. I'm from North Carolina. Adam was, it, it depends. It depends on what day. He was into everything, just mischievous and just, oh my gosh, I, I can't even explain him. We all agreed that one of us would kill him before he got to be 16 years old. He would try to command and be the center of attention, whether it was opening your present at Christmas time when you didn't get a chance to open it or doing something stupid or whatever it may be. He was that kind of kid. When I look back, he never really got in bad trouble. It was always just enough to make you mad at him where you wanted to just pinch his head off. <laughs> Adam told me one day, he said, I'm the future of Petty Enterprise. I said, I'm gonna start looking for me a job. <laughs> and and I, it was all in fun, you know, cause he was, Lord, he was such an ordinary kid. All at once, it was like the most miraculous transformation you've ever seen in your life. He come in one day when he was, I don't know, 14 or 15 years old and said, that's it, I want to be a race car driver. In his mind, there was a focus. In his mind, there was a purpose. And he could see the end result on where he wanted to be. 17 years old, just graduated from high school. He's not mowing lawns 
this summer, folks. He is winning his first ASA race. History being made tonight. Wow. In my mind, we had got to a point where we weren't competitive as an organization. And all of a sudden, here was this 18-year-old kid who could be the fire plug to kickstart Petty Enterprises. Adam Petty, look out for him. He's a story into himself today. He's not just out there riding around. He's racing, and he's racing very well. That multicolored, rainbow-colored car is Adam Petty, number 45. If he'd have won the Daytona 500 later on in his career, it wouldn't have been any bigger win than what that particular race was. He's got tons of talent, man. He's, he's a lot better race car driver than I ever thought about being. Uh, he, he may rival his grandfather at some point in time, but it's good to know that somebody's going to be winning some races that has the last name Petty for a long time to come. This is the Petty's future. This is their future. This boy is exactly like his granddaddy. He's natured like his granddaddy. He drives like his granddaddy. This is the petty future. I just always looked at Adam different than I looked at Kyle because Adam wanted to be a race car driver. He made that commitment. And Adam was going to be the thing. That was when I probably began mentally to take myself out of a race car and say, okay, it's time for me to get out of a race car because this is this kid's time. This is Adam's time. It was just the natural progression for me to become an owner and him to become a driver. Is your dad being as active in your career as he looks like he's been? A ton. He helps me more than anything in the world, you know. He's always there for me. Uh, you know, right now he's over there having problems with his Winston Cup team and he's over here helping us on the ARCA stuff trying to get fast. Oh, yeah. You know, I got a Winnebago and he's got a, a motorhome and, and half the time I never bring mine, I just room with him and, and, and stay with him and that's pretty neat. We, we're, like I said, we're like best friends on, on the road and uh, we share a lot together and, and have a lot of fun together. It's another layer to our relationship, you know what I mean? And it's a layer that I think I missed with my father. I never remember leaving the house where my father would hug me and tell me that he loved me. We weren't a huggy family. And that's the difference in our relationship compared to the way I was raised. Richard, he doesn't pat you on the back and pay you compliments. And that's part of, I think, Kyle and Richard's problem because I think sometimes Kyle expects to have a pat on the back or his daddy to tell him he's done something good but Richard just doesn't pass out the praises very often. Kyle and myself were never as close as what both of us wanted, but we didn't have time. I didn't have time. Then Kyle looks at it and says, it didn't happen with me and my dad, but it is going to happen with me and my son. I don't mean this in a bad way, but my father and I are not close friends. He's my father, um, and, and, and that's just the way that is. With Adam, I tried to say, we're going to be friends, okay? I'm always going to be your father, and I'm going to be the guy that spanks you, and I'm going to be the guy that disciplines you, and I'm going to be the guy that jumps on you when you do something wrong. But at the same time, you should be able to call me when something's happened in your life, or you should be able to talk to me about this or talk about that. Every young kid wants to be just like their father, and uh, I've grown up seeing him race, and uh, something that I've always wanted to do. And uh, I really can't believe it's happening when I'm 19, uh, trying to make my first Winston Cup race. But uh, 
if we do succeed tomorrow in qualifying and we do make the race, uh, it'll be something very, very special. In April 2000, the keys to the family kingdom were passed to a new generation of Petty. In his first attempt, he qualified for his first Cup Series race. By making the field, Adam made history. I think he was proud to be the first fourth generation professional sportsman in the whole world. He was going to do everything he could to uphold that name. The thousands and thousands of people that have played anything, sports, professionally, and we were the first family to do something for four generations, I mean, unheard of. I think he was handling it good. It wasn't about, I'm a race car driver. I'm going to be a big race car driver. I'll make lots of money. He was natured more like Richard, and he was like, I just want to race like Granddaddy. I just want to race. It all started with Lee Petty, and then it went to Richard and, and my dad, and then me. There's four generations of us, and we're all still alive, and we've all done the same thing in a 50-year period of time. Three days after 19-year-old Adam's first Cup Series start, the patriarch of the Petty family passed away. And just five weeks after Lee's death, the name Petty would again be etched in stone. In New Hampshire today, fourth generation member of stock car racing's most famous family was killed today in an accident on the track. The 19-year-old Petty died of head injuries after he crashed during practice for a race tomorrow at the New Hampshire International Speedway. Adam Petty was the son of current driver Kyle Petty, grandson of Richard, and the great-grandson of NASCAR pioneer Lee Petty. I was here uh, in the body shop, somebody come and got me and said, hey, somebody needs you on the telephone. And uh, Hilton had called and said, Adam just had a terrible accident, said it don't look good. He came in and when he did, he, he looked over there at me and I said, Adam's gone. And he went down on his knees and he started crying and he said and the, he should not have even thought this but he said maybe i should have just been a farmer we were, we were just really close you know and we just you know we, we used to joke about being we used to joke about being father and son and best friend but it was it was a lot truer. And all the things you do in life, I would hope and pray no one ever loses a child. That, that has to be the worst thing that could ever happen. And, and what I mean by that is this. You have a grandfather, you have a father, you're a father, and then you have a child. Well, the way it's supposed to be is the older generation passes first. So when it gets out of order, then you begin to question, okay, what else in life is not right? So the darkness comes from the profound loss of losing someone that you truly love and that was a part of you. But the darkness also comes from being thrust into a whole new world where you don't know what the rules are. Um, I wished I could give you a... Um a magical, mystical, miraculous answer to how you deal with the loss, but there isn't. Everybody deals with it differently, and unfortunately, when you go through what we've been through, you wake up in the morning, and you still have to get up, and you don't wanna. Um, it's very hard, but you, you have to make a choice. 
and you have to work very, very hard at um, choosing to be powerful instead of pitiful. Initially, I blamed myself. You know, blamed, blamed our life. Then one day, I had for that, I got a, a little note from some lady. And the little note said, you know, never put a question mark where God's put a period. And that was just, that lifted, uh, that lifted everything off of me. I mean, I said, okay. You know, it, it was meant to be. I didn't have that much control over it. And we will just have to pick up everything from here. There was a fork in the road, and we could go either way. We could look at it and be incredibly bitter because we had lost a son. Or we could look at it and say we were very blessed to have Adam for these 19 years. Don't say it's over. Cause that's the worst news I could hear. I swear that I will. Do my best to be here just the way you like it. Even though it's hard to hide, push my feelings all aside. I will rearrange my plans and change for you. I think he looked at it the same way as I did, that the last thing in the world Adam would have wanted to happen is for us to change our lifestyle. Kyle Petty on everybody's mind here today, driving the car that his son Adam had campaigned prior to his untimely death a few weeks ago in New Hampshire. When I would go to the racetrack and get in his car and get in his seat, I never put my seat in the car, I always drove in his seat. I felt closer to him in that car than I felt anywhere else. If I could go back, that's the first thing I would do, I swear that I would. Do my best to follow through, come up with a master plan, a home run hit, a winning stand, a guarantee and not a promise that I'd never let your love slip from my hands. I can't say I was ever angry. Uh, and I can answer that very fast. Um, this sport, we choose to do this. This is not something we have to do. Um, and, and this sport's been incredible to us. I mean, I, I look at what my grandfather's done, what my father did, um, the life I've led, um, the years that Adam drove a car and what he did and, and, and how he reacted to it. Look at the joy it brought Adam. Look at the way it did this. Look at the way it did that. So for me, there's no reason to be angry. I think he was a blessing and everything about his life was a blessing. Once there was a race shop, alive with horsepower and manpower, filled with championship dreams that came to life. But by 2009, Petty Enterprises was no more. After 60 years, the family business closed its doors. It was just a situation where we, we didn't have our heart and soul in it like what, what we really need to be. You gotta be so dedicated to do this kind of work. Just to see the Hollywood Halls being empty uh, is real heartbreaking. Maybe we failed as keeping it alive. Can I look back and say, what could we have done different to save it? I guess the money just went away. Like dropping an egg and it just busted. And that's it. If you'd have told me 50 years ago this shop would be closed, everything gone, all our people gone, I'd have said, no way. We're going to be here forever. This is all dead and gone. And that's a terrible way to feel about it, but it is. It's dead and gone. Only the name was left. Not Petty. Richard Petty. The King took his name to a new team. 
but the family business was gone. At Richard Petty Motorsports, there was no room for Kyle Petty. That was very, very, very hard because it, it was, you know, hitting them upside the head and said, we don't need you. And it wasn't that I didn't need them, I just couldn't afford to keep them. I know everybody thinks, what did he do that to his son for? And he didn't do it on purpose. He's told me over a thousand times, I would never done anything to hurt my son. But there was nowhere for him to go. And there's not many people out there now beating a door down for 50-year-old drivers. I will never say that I was as mad as I was disappointed in the process. But it's part of life. And this is a cruel business, so let's be, let's be true about that too. Our sport has grown to the point that it can be a cold, hard business. It's sad to see uh, an enterprise of that sort not be here anymore, uh, one that perhaps had more to do with the growth and image of the sport than any other. I always thought that was a little bit better. See, the deal is blue's real pleasing color, so I'm going to get everybody in a pleasing mood. Maybe I can paint this blue for when you Yeah, I'm going to paint the whole building blue. <laughs> he is not going to quit going to the race. He loves the racing, and that's so much a part of his life. As long as he can get up, be a part of a team, I want him to. I don't want him to come sit down at home and turn into an old man. This is the environment that I feel comfortable in. Maybe I'm scared to, to try something else. I don't know. Even though we've had heartbreaks and setbacks, overall, I don't know of anything that we could have accomplished any more for the Petty family. Adam's death, Kyle and Patty opened the Victory Junction Gang Camp, a place where chronically ill children can come to laugh and smile, just like Adam once did. We lost one son, but we've gained 10,000 children in the process, because in the first five years, that's about how many kids have come to camp. So what you feel there and what you see in these children's faces, when they smile, you see Adam smile. I think you get that same smile and that same twinkle in these kids' eyes because here they are doing something that maybe they never ever in their life dreamed they would ever be able to do. I would like to thank you, everyone that helped me to swim the other day. It's an incredible place. It's right down from the race shop where Petty Enterprises started. It's the same dirt that we raised race cars on. We're just changing children on that now. I still hurt, I still cry every day. I'm not over it, Kyle's not over it. So for us to look like we're some martyrs that we were able to deal with his loss and get past it and go on, that's not so. We have been very blessed that we've had an opportunity to be able to take that hurt and use it to the good. When I see some of the things he's done and the, and the strength and the courage he's had to go on, I have to admire him for it, because it would have been easy to throw in the towel and to go on and let his life fall apart. I think when you look at, at my grandfather's career, all the races that he won, uh, when you look at my father's career and the races and the championships that, that they have won, uh, when you look at the races I've won and the things I did, when you look at what Adam did, and you put it in a pile, it makes a pretty big pile. But I think, in the end, when you look at the legacy of what this family has meant to this sport, I don't think you'll look at that as much as you'll look at the camp. And you'll look at that camp and you'll say, look at what these kids have gone on to do. 
Some of these kids may go on to be doctors and cure the disease that they have. Some of these kids may go on to be teachers. Some of these kids may go on to be some of the best parents and raise the future leaders of this country. And I think when you look at it, this and the scheme of life that I know now is a lot bigger than what I thought was life before Adam's accident. I don't know that Richard Petty will ever be known as the greatest driver that ever lived. That's in material. The one thing he always said was, look at everything we've got. We've got each other, our children, our home. What more in this life would you ever want? You know, you, you look at it and you made a dent, but it's such a small dent in, in the world. And so I always look at it from a standpoint that whether you remember the Petty family in a good, bad, or indifferent, at least you remember them. So that's about all you can ask. him a ride tomorrow he would get out there but I would probably knock him upside the head first y'all look at that you got to take this daggone shot and show it he's carrying a purse can you see that? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, you it, it had little beads on it. I steal a purse, I don't care. A little playing little beads. Beads. Playing burly. I told him, I said, I don't care who's in the winter circle, who you have to hug or kiss, it's who you take home. And that's me. <laughs> How's Linda? Linda's doing good, I reckon. She's hollered at me when I left this morning. She'll holler when I get back, so. He does wear sunglasses to church. He does wear sunglasses. He does not wear his cowboy hat to church. That's because, secretly, I think his eyes close sometimes while he's in church. <laughs> I know he's the king of NASCAR. That's like his little nickname or whatever. He's a NASCAR legend for him. When you hear NASCAR, that's who you should be thinking of, because he's the one that started it all. American icon, yeah. We're also joined today by one of NASCAR's all-time greats, the king, Richard Petty. He's sitting right in the front row where he belongs. I keep thinking, wonder what my life would have been like if I could have married somebody that just led a normal life. I could have had normal family, done normal things, and I wouldn't have all his stress. <laughs> and he tells me, yeah, but it wouldn't have been near as entertaining. <laughs>